The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Hold your hands out as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Today I'm going to talk about the last name. Now, God has lots of names for his people, but I've talked about six or seven of them. And today I'm going to talk about the last one. And that is this. You are an ambassador. You're not a salesperson. You're not just a Christian. You're not just someone who believes. The scripture tells us that we're an ambassador. An ambassador is someone who goes to another people on behalf of the king or on behalf of the country to negotiate, to talk, to develop relations, to trade. And when this ambassador goes, she or he brings with them a sense of power, the ability to make a deal, the ability to declare war or declare peace. And God has asked you in this age to be an ambassador. In a time when people are afraid, people are struggling, there is a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of negativity. God is asking you to be a representative of the kingdom of God. That is a hopeful, peaceful person. You are an ambassador. And that means a whole, whole lot to me. And it means a lot to the Lord. I remember so many ambassadors that came into my life that helped me develop into the person I am. You obviously think of parents and family members and things like that. But there was one couple in particular there was a, it was actually two neighbors we had, one to the right of us when we lived in Burbank and, and a couple that lived behind us. And the guy to the right, both of them were wonderful people and both of them were Christians. The guy to the right, he was this wonderful old man and I would go over to his house and he would, I was 15, he'd teach me how to use tools. He would teach me how to build things and teach me how to fix things. And he taught me stuff about locksmithing and, and clocks and stuff like this. And was really a wonderful man, but he would say this thing, don't go to the Meachams. You know, he was like, there is this family behind you, this couple, and they are strange. I came to find out they didn't really know each other, the Meachams and this guy. So eventually my, my sister, who didn't hear this warning from this neighbor, began going to the Meachams' house. I forget how she met them. And she would go over there on a regular occasion and she would hear from them and, and found out they were very committed Christians. They would pray with her. They would talk to her. And all of a sudden, Angie, my sister, began to have this radical transformation. And I remember going over there and I remember one time they, they like prophesied over my life and it, it, it ended up being totally true. And they prayed, but they were not, they weren't really weird. They were just sweet, loving. There's this old couple and they became a sanctuary for me and for members of my family. And I wasn't really a Christian at the time. I mean, I would have called myself a Christian, but I had no real deep relationship with God. I didn't, you know, I was into some things that were definitely not Christian. And, and I remember during that time, just having something begin to change in me because of this older couple. They were, in a way, the guide that I needed to be pointed in the direction of God. It was not long after that I did come to a radical conversion of faith, but I always felt like without the Meachams, I don't know if our family on my mom's side would have gone through this radical transformation. And I know I personally would not have, and I'm pretty sure my sister wouldn't have either. It's interesting because I remember what my grandpa said once. He said, in the kingdom of God, there are some people who plant the seed there are some people who care for, you know, they water the seed and make it grow. There are some who trim the tree 
And there are some who take the harvest. But then he said, but there are some who go to hard, dry ground and they till the soil. They prepare it for the planter. And he looked at me and he said, Bobby, that's what I do. And he did do that. He went to people that wanted nothing to do with God and he softened their heart. You may not have a big ministry. You may not have millions of followers. You may not have books that you've published or CDs that have gone out or albums that have gone out to tons of people. But every day that you're faithful to God, to loving your neighbor with all your heart and loving God with all your heart and representing his kingdom everywhere you go, a kingdom of reconciliation and of peace and of brotherly kindness, you will see when you get to the end, when things are truly weighed, the effect that your decision to do the next right thing had on history. Now, when we talk about God, sometimes we talk about his office and sometimes we talk about his name. When you say God, you're not saying his name, you're saying his office. When you say Yahweh, when you say Jesus, you're saying his name. So when, I, when you say pastor to me, you're not, ta- you're not saying my name, you're saying my office. When you say Bobby or Pastor Bobby to me, you're saying my name. It's personal. When you say Pastor Bobby, you're combining both, my office and my name. And today I want to talk about the name of the Lord, not just God, but what Yahweh, what it means to have this name Yahweh in our lives. The Jews begin in a way truly carrying the name of God before this, but really at the burning bush experience. Moses is out in the field and he sees this bush and it's burning. It wouldn't be super strange to see a bush on fire in the middle of the desert, but to see it burning and still burning yet and not consuming the green leaves, to see a green bush that's not burning down but just continues to light up like this is a curious thing at the the least. We know the story that Moses approaches the bush and it's God or an angel of the Lord, we're not sure, that speaks out to Moses and tells him to take his shoes off, that he's on holy ground. He approaches the bush and the bush tells him that his people who have been been enslaved by Pharaoh are to be set free. If you don't know the story, go watch, you know, Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt or something. I I assume most of us know the story, but, but Moses approaches the bush and Moses asks this, asks God, the office, a question. He clearly knows what he's seeing as God or as divine. He knows that this is his people's God. Remember, Moses is more Egyptian in the story than he is Jewish yet, right? He's he's ethnically Jewish and his mother who sort of raised him is Hebrew, but he's also very Egyptian. He's a prince. He's he's wealthy. He's educated in Egyptian occult stuff. and, And the ancient world believed that to have the the name of of a God, of course we believe there's only one God, but they believed in many gods. To have the name of a God in a way was was to take a bit of that God's power with you. So it's interesting that when Moses asks this curious burning bush, what is your name? That's a, that's chutzpah. That's a very, that's a bold question to ask a burning bush. What is, what is your name? And it could be, this is Bobby talking, that Moses wants more than an order. He wants power to act on behalf of this God. The bush says to him, I am that I am, etc., and tells him my name is Yahweh, Yahweh, which sounds like I am. I could go on and on about the Yahweh name. We don't have time this morning, but the most important thing to know is that God gives this name to Moses 
and it is a treasure. For Moses, this name means that he speaks with authority. For God, it means that he has God's power, right? In many ways he does. He splits the ocean and he turns his cane to snake and heals, etc. But he also represents God to Pharaoh and to Aaron. And this name becomes this very important thing. I have a slide here. This is from the church of Saint-Germain-de-Prix. De Prey. My French is terrible. It's a, from a church in Paris. It's the oldest church in Paris. And you can see here is the name of the, of the Lord in Hebrew. Without these dog ashes, but it's... In English, we would say YH, a, a YHWH. Yahweh. Or Yehovah. Or Yehovah. We don't know, but it sure sounds like breathing, like life, like power. And it means I am that I am, or it means he that will be, or something along that line. And this name, as it was given to the Hebrew people, became effectively the banner under which they would do things. And they, as we are, became ambassadors for God, whose name is Yahweh whose name is Yahweh, and, and were to carry or take this name with them as a sign of power, that our power does not come from man, it doesn't come from anything, it comes from God. And as we carry this name with us, we carry something that gives us power, that gives us authority, but most importantly, represents what kind of God we serve. A God who is merciful, a God who is peace-loving and kind, a God who is joyful. Do you know God is joyful? Dallas Willard says, God is the most joyful person in the universe. Just full of joy, overflowing. And this is what God is like. The ancient world had never heard of a God like that. And everywhere they went, they declared this name, Yahweh, the Lord, is one. So I want to ask you a question. If you went to a Christian school, Catholic school, or something like that, you probably memorized the Ten Commandments. What does the third commandment mean? The third commandment in, in, in the Jewish context says... You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? Let me ask you a question. You have to be imaginative here. I'm assuming you know what I mean when I say this. But if you say the curse, the curse word or curse phrase, GD, right? If I say GD, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? If you say that, are you taking the name of the Lord in vain? And the if you're splitting hairs, okay, if you're splitting hairs, you are technically not taking the name of the Lord in vain. Because G, God, isn't his name, it's his office. So to bellow out GD, that's a sin. It's always a sin. It's always bad. You shouldn't do it. But you're not technically breaking this commandment to take the name of the Lord in vain. So what does it mean then? It doesn't mean probably what you think it means. Before we answer what it means to take his name in vain, let's answer the question, what does it mean to simply take his name? The Jews carried or took the name of the Lord, and that meant to carry God's name, to take God's name, meant to become his family. What did it mean when Hannah took my name, the name Schuler? It meant that we became a new family. We became Mr. and Mrs. Bobby and Hannah Schuler. She took my name. And she has never taken my name in vain. That's a stupid joke. I'm sorry. No, we, but we have, and my kids have this name, Shuler, right? When you took the Lord's name, you, became, you entered into covenant with him. He became your God and you became his people. And by taking the Lord's name, as you would in marriage or any other way of taking a name, you took upon yourself representing him. So for the Jews, to take God's name means two things, really. It means, one, to treasure this name, Yahweh. Jews, just to be careful, have 
They, they don't utter the name Yahweh. And in fact, I, I'm careful to do that myself. I think it's appropriate here in a sanctuary and in a sermon. And ancient Jews would utter the name, but because they were so worried, eventually they stopped. They, they stopped pronouncing it. So we actually don't know how to technically pronounce the name of God. We guess because there's no vowels in Hebrew. So we have to guess what the vowels are. And when they write it, and as they read it, like even today, if, if a Jewish person is reading a Hebrew text, they won't say Yahweh. They'll say Adonai, which is the Hebrew word that means my Lord. Um, Ultra-Orthodox today won't even say Adonai. They will say Hashem, which means the name. So they're even putting another layer between them and God. So that, but it's this idea that like God gave us this treasure and we have to respect it. We have to fear it. We have to treat it with dignity. But that has a deeper meaning to it. The deeper meaning is this. Be, because he's given you his name, it is a sign of the covenant that you are his people and that wherever you go, you represent him. In other words, to take the name of the Lord means to represent him whenever you do things. It'd be, think of all the things in the secular world you do in the name of something. A police officer might say, stop in the name of the, of the law, right? You know, you might see, you know, open the door in the name of King George. It's interesting if, now I, as, a, as an American, I have veiled contempt for monarchies. You know, it's just not in our blood. But, you know, there is something fun about when you go to England or any other monarchy, everything is the king's or the queen's, right? It's the queen's lawn, the queen's highway, the queen's hall. Every boat says HMS, Her Majesty's Service. So, and then everything that the army does and others do, they do in the name of the queen or in the name of the king. So a people who come from monarchies or kingdoms understand that whether or not you say it, as a British soldier back in the day, when you wore a red coat, you represented King George. As a French soldier, when you put on a blue coat, you represented King Louis. You carried with you a name that was a culture, that was a way of doing war, that was a way of negotiating, it was a way of even silly things like eating and telling jokes and a language. You, as someone who carries God's name, represent him everywhere you go. In other words, everything we do, whether we like it or not, if you're a believer, you do it in the name of Jesus. Therefore, a Jewish understanding of taking the Lord's name in vain is either one, disrespecting the name, which we all understand, using it in curse, curse language or not treating it with fear the way that it's supposed to be. But two, and more importantly, it's to falsely represent that what you're doing is from God when it's not. And you can see why it may be that taking the Lord's name in vain is worse than murder. How can you say something like that? Well, here are some big obvious examples of taking the Lord's name in vain. The Crusades, right? God did not order the Crusades. God did not want the Crusades. But through the Crusades, millions of innocent women and children were effectively killed in the name of the, the church or killed in the name of Jesus. The Inquisitions, divine right of kings, defense of slavery in the South, false prophecy. We had that all the time when I was in college at a charismatic college. We had people that would say, like, the Lord wants us to marry, you know. And the girl would say, like, well, you, the Lord needs to tell me, you know, this kind of thing. Or, or a false gospel, you know, pr preaching preaching a gospel that's, that's apart from what Paul told. Any of these saying, saying that this evil thing we're doing is from the Lord is, is truly what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. It means to represent him in a way that is false. You can see how this has caused so much harm, not, not only directly through things like murder and rape, but even more so by harming people's view of God. Satan loves it when we take the Lord's name in vain. It makes his job 
Very easy. I remember when my mom talked about when she got locked out of a, on a roof by her youth pastor who said that this was for her good so she'd stop sinning. That was taking the Lord's name in vain. Or when a church used to tell my uncle because he had long hair that he was uh, Charles Manson. And, and, and that by shaming him, he would be, that was taking the Lord's name in vain. They were falsely representing God to people. And, and remember, th th that is, to God, it's an abomination. Okay. To also take the Lord's name in vain means to not do something when you, so like with your sins of commission, like, like what we just said, but there's also sins of omission, which is like the Good Samaritan story. You know, someone needs to be helped and you do nothing. If Moses had been given the Lord's name and didn't go to Pharaoh, he would have taken the name in vain. All of this to simply say, I'm so proud of you that you have not taken the Lord's name in vain, but you have understood that everywhere you go, you are proclaiming his, his kingdom and his glory in a world that needs people like you. Well, friends, I'm going too slow. I haven't even gotten to the scripture and the sermon time is already over. So let me just finish with the scripture. This is from Paul who says you're an ambassador and that's effectively what it means. To, an ambassador means to be someone like you who carries the Lord's name in the spirit of reconciliation and peace. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. You're a new creation. You're a new creation. God is, forget all the things. You're, you, you think, oh, I don't want to be a hypocrite, or I, I don't. God has totally changed. Today is a new day. doesn't matter what you've done. The Lord can forgive you if you trust in him, and he will. Paul says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Just listen to how often that word reconciliation is making itself known. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, to be reconciled to God. What does that mean? It means that as an ambassador, your job is to go into these chaotic, angry places and be a reconciler. Be someone who brings people together and doesn't split them up. Be someone who brings peace and not the sword. Be someone who brings life and not death. Be someone who brings encouragement and not discouragement. To not discount the huge impact you can make on someone's life just because you said a kind word or just because you put an arm around them and encouraged them or just because you decided even in a place like social media to not be, you know, bitter and angry, but to be kind and, 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 and all the things that you're doing that you recognize, man, God has given me his name. He's given me his power, his life, his joy. Everywhere I go, I'm just going to like, I picture it this way. David said, my cup runneth over. I think it's like, picture your life as one in which you're so full of God's life, you just choose to kind of like spill a little bit. You know, you just kind of like, you go into a room and just be you and just kind of spill God's life and love to your neighbors. Just watch how much of a blessing that can make. Friends, all of us to say that I'm so proud of you. And don't think that you're having some small impact. I want you to know that as you continue to do the next right thing, you continue to, to notice hurting people. You continue to notice people who are alone or people who are beat up and you heal them and you speak to them and you encourage them and you lift them up and you love them and you share your faith with them and you pray for them and, and you send them encouraging notes. I want you to know, it seems like that's not a big thing. It's a, it really, especially in a time like this, can have such a huge impact. You are an ambassador for the Lord, for Jesus, an ambassador of reconciliation, and I'm so glad you're doing 
what you're doing. I'm so proud of you. Keep doing it and trust that God's going to make a huge impact for the kingdom through you. I know, I know he will. Well, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us your Holy Spirit. And I just pray in Jesus' name for all of the sleeping heroes, all of those who think they're, they're too messed up or they have too much baggage or maybe they have too much sin in their life or they have, too, they have a past. We just first just thank you, God, that you can wash us clean and, and renew us and refresh us and restore us and give us a new mind and new habits and new behaviors. But we don't have to wait for all of those things. We don't have to be perfect to be an ambassador for your kingdom. There is no perfect ambassador. We just pray humbly, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work through us, that we would use what we have to be an encouragement to our neighbor, to be a representative of your life and love. Lord, we thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. And now for the benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For 50 years, Hour of Power has been sharing the good news of God's love around the world and empowering others to do the same. To celebrate every minute of the Lord's faithfulness in this milestone year, our team has created a special gift that we hope will remind you of His goodness and our gratitude. For your generous gift of $75 or more, you'll receive the Minutes and Milestones 50th Anniversary Set. Beautifully packaged in a sturdy commemorative box, each gift contains an oversized black coffee mug embossed with the golden Hour of Power 50th Anniversary logo an individual serving coffee packet from Hidden House Coffee, a premium local roaster in Orange County, and a reprint of Dr. Robert Schuller's mini devotional book, God's Minute Three, 365 daily affirmations for positive prayer. Call, write, or go online and request the Minutes and Milestones 50th anniversary set. Quantities are limited, so request your gift today. As a faithful friend and supporter of the Hour of Power, you have come alongside us in a difficult time and infused fresh hope. While July and August are traditionally challenging for us as a ministry, this year the summer slump is hitting us especially hard. With the lingering effects of the COVID-19 crisis, we're desperately in need of financial support. Because I know you understand the importance of our mission, I'm asking for your help today. Thank you for your continued prayer and generosity. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.